Oh hey you sexy bitches and welcome back to this week's Weekly D and today I have my good friend Darren on with me and myself and Darren are going to be talking about the crossover between the dance industry and the pole industry and my god it's so interesting to see what a variation there is in both of the industries. I also just want to give a quick trigger warning that there will be discussions on homophobia so if this is something that is of not of interest to you please make sure you go and listen to one of the other awesome episodes that you can find on this podcast. But without further ado, this is the weekly D. Because, honey, if you ain't getting your D on the daily, you better at least be getting it once on the weekly. If you're not getting any, if you want some tea, then come and join Dan up on the weekly D. It's the weekly D. Hey Darren, thank you so much for coming on to my podcast and thank you for doing this so last minute as well. I'm sorry, I literally messaged you the other day. I was like, Darren, I want to talk to you about this. Will you come on? And you were like, um, I was, I was, okay. I was like, I can do next month. And you were like, what, <laughs> what, what about tomorrow? <laughs> I was like, I've got a gap. Yeah, great. Let's go. Yay. I'm so glad that I caught you. Um, so before we get this going, I want um, to give you an opportunity just for anybody who maybe doesn't know who you are to give them a little intro to who you are, what you do, what your work kids and just things like that really so go for it give us a little bio on okay. who Darren is so um my work um mainly fitness actually nowadays so it's um actually a lot of Pilates work um I teach dance so ballroom and Latin um but actually the majority of my work is Pilates and fitness um but I've been dancing for about I, I was trying to work out 17 years now um, wow. so I've been dancing ballroom and Latin for 17 years um and pole for when, when was Ooh, 26 well I, I've, I've lost track but I, I haven't really processed any pandemic years so I'm like I'm like oh it's four years I'm like it's not four years it's um yeah. seven years maybe six right Something. yeah because you miss out those two years right we just we forget they happened <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, 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 I'm going with it and like I'm, I turned 30 in the pandemic I'm still 30 we'll go with that as well. yeah, yeah. I, that's yeah. fine I was gonna yeah. say um, so yeah so, so and you so you got into po um into the dancing first then you got into pole dancing tell us about how when you started how you got into the lesson ballroom where, where did yeah. that all start so um I'd actually danced in my teenage years quite a bit so I'd done like some musical theatre stuff I'd done all of that um, I was kind of like that kid who crossed over everything. So I was like doing sports, I was doing musical theatre stuff, I was doing kind of, yeah, anything and everything. I was really good academically. So I was kind of like that one who was doing a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, when I went to uni, I wanted, I wanted to do more dancing. Um, whenever like I auditioned for anything when I was younger, I was like, my singing was like here, like my, my dancing was way better. So right. I was like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna take up a dance style for, fully out. Um, and I ended up going with Ballroom and Latin. So, yeah, fresh as fair. I was like, okay, we're going to go around the stalls. It was a pole stool, actually, I remember. Um, but I didn't do pole at that point. Um, I actually ended up going to Ballroom and Latin. So, at, yeah, at the age of 18, I ended up being, like, joining the Ballroom and Latin Society. Um, I did beginner year. So I did a year of beginner, won everything at beginners at uh, the nationals. So yeah, of course I, I kind of, when I was like, I'm doing this, I was like, I'm doing it full scale. I'm like putting in however, like four hours a night into my dancing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there, I kind of went. Was there, there any same um, sex? I got a, oh, sorry. I was just about to say, was there any same sex dancing? At no, no, no. So like actually like at that time, so so yeah, I didn't even know same-sex dancing was a thing. Like in the nicest possible way, my kind of only introduction to ballroom at that point was Strictly. So like Strictly Come Dancing was huge at the time. It's big now, but it was like really, it was newer at that time as well. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, my assumption was that actually dancing was always going to be man and woman. Um, right. So, which which is funny how things have turned out now. <laughs> right, amazing. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so at that time I danced with a girl and then I had a dance partner um, for uh, the next four years, um, so we we danced mainstream world for those four years. Um, so yeah, um, I danced with her, which was great. Then I had post uni, I had another dance partner, um, and then I ended up um, having a gap where I didn't have a dance partner. Um, so I spoke to one of my friends, Vishesh, um, like as in he didn't have a dance partner. Um, so we were like, oh, should we do some practice? And, um, yeah, we, we were like, yeah, let's do some practicing, like just as I'm dancing together. And um, no intention of competing, no intention of kind of anything. Um, and yeah, we ended up dancing and ended up married. 
I was going to say, yeah. and then you got yeah. married. That is just, isn't that like the nicest? Like, at least it's, do you know what? I feel like, especially in this generation, it's a lot of, oh, we met on Grindr. You, you just hear it all the time, right? Everyone's meeting on Grindr. I understand that. But when you hear. To be completely honest, go um, on. we originally met on Tinder. Okay, um, well that's better than Grindr, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, but, so we originally mounted and we didn't actually um, get together at that point. But we, we stayed contacts, we stayed friends at that point, like as in, okay. and then, um, yeah, but it was after us dancing that we ended up actually as a couple. That's actually so nice. But isn't that nice that you kind of like, as friends, we're just dancing and that it just like built this relationship. I just yeah. love that. Yeah. Um, and like, so... Going back a little bit, sorry. Um, so going back to um, when you were dancing, you were dancing with girls all the time. Um, obviously, back then, I assume, so for anyone who doesn't know, Darren did not do a good enough bio at all. Darren is like a freaking champion, same sex, Latin and ballroom dancer. He wins all these competitions with his husband, Vijesh. They are amazing. Literally, I have to say as well, but I, I might even have to share it on my own stories again when this airs. But they did the most amazing first dance I've ever seen at any wedding ever. It was so good. Um, two songs, of course, because one song is not enough. And it was um, it was just fabulous. It was amazing. Um, so you did not do yourself any yeah, wedding. Yeah, I, I, I'm really it. bad. At, I'm really bad at selling myself. As <laughs> <laughs> I should I should have been. I should have a list of like, oh, these are my titles. Yeah, <laughs> it's so no, hard. I, to, like, I can't do that. It's so hard to big yourself up, but that's what I'm here for. It's fine. I just want everyone to know how awesome you are. <laughs> but um so yeah so that obviously um was something that back in the day when you were doing it when you were younger i assume back then was it same sex i mean competitions was stuff like that even a thing yeah so there has, there's been some amazing people in the equality dance world who have really pushed forward same sex dancing so since the 80s um I can think of like Jackie Logan, people on her team who pushed forward one of the events, the Pink Jukebox Trophy. Um, wow. That's been running for many years. So I'm not going to say that like we've kind of come in and changed things, as in there were people before us doing insane things. Uh -huh. um, but it was a different, it was a different era. And actually, I've, I've got more respect for those people who had to really fight for it in those days, in the sense that in mainstream classes, it would be seen as you automatically, if you're a woman, you will be dancing the follower role. Follower role. If you're a man, you're going to be leading, like automatically, as in they're fine letting women dance with women because they're not enough men. But um, if um, yeah, if if it's if it's if you've got equal numbers, it would be men leading, women following. Mm -hmm. um, even in my uni society, that's how it was. Um, so that's yeah, it was a while ago, but not that far ago. <laughs> I don't know if this is a stupid question. Was um. You know, you kept saying, like, um, wom the woman following man leading. Is there ever a situation where a female and male dancing together where the female would lead? Yeah, so um, that's not cool. very commonly. Um, so, again, now we call it, so now actually kind of moving on, we've moved on to equality dancing. So it was a phase where we would call it same-sex dancing, um, where we'd have kind of men dancing with men, women dancing with women, some competitions for that sort of thing. But actually... There's so many more elements to it. Gender's way more than that as well, in the sense right. that non-binary individuals who want to dance, as in wanting to do kind of different roles, also switching roles. Um, so you could switch a role within a dance. Um, as in, when I dance socially, I may want to kind of, actually, I want to lead for a bit, but then I'm like, oh, actually, I want to, want to follow now. So I'll kind of give a signal to say, you lead me now. I was like, I've done, I've done the work of leading. Now come and give me something to answer. Right. So yeah, there are some people who do, um, women, women, um, lead and men follow. Um, but it's not so common. Um, and in the mainstream kind of world, there's very few couples. Um, there was, there's a couple of people who do it awesomely. Um, but it's, but it's, it's, it's not particularly common. Um, right. I wish it was so much more common. Um, there's a, there's a thing I always say whenever I give a, like a speech, um, or we, we, we're doing a performance and we have a little gap to talk in between. I always say, if I ever have a daughter, I don't want her going into a dance class and being told automatically your follower. Right. Like, that's crazy. Any other industry that would be completely wrong. Like saying, boys, you're in charge. Girls, you're going to be following. Mm. That's just, just, just crazy nowadays. We should right. be like getting girls to lead if they want to lead, boys to follow. I think it'd be good for little boys to kind of automatically be told, oh, you're a follower. Kind of learn that ability to kind of listen, to kind of actually take signals and kind of not be told automatically you have to be in charge. 
Um, and yeah. I think it's a really important thing, actually. Well, it just feeds into that sort of like gender roles, toxic masculinity, the man's in charge, doesn't it? And for, yeah. especially for an industry that is very gay male dominated, right? Which is very odd, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. As in, um, yeah. So, so there was a, there was a, our coach was saying there was one, one point where in the top, top people in the world, like something like four out of the six finalists in the world, world championships, um, four out of the six were gay men. Right. Um, but most of them not out as a result. Um, ah. And, just... and do you think that's something that's still, because obviously there must have been a time where it just was not accepted, probably way before us, I would say, um, where it wasn't accepted at all. Um, and then, like, I assume there's a little bit of sort of homophobia that still lingers within the industry even now. Can you tell us a bit about that? Have you had any experience? Yeah, with that? Um, so a lot of it now is bias. Um, so a lot of the time I actually say it's not even around homophobia, as in people are fine with um, us dancing. So for Shirt and I, we compete in a lot of big mainstream competitions. Mm -hmm. um, and actually the majority of judges are like, oh, yeah. Um, but our marks are much more polarised than a lot of other couples. So you'll get some judges absolutely loving us. You'll get some judges giving us nothing. Like literally like the, the lowest, like as in not putting us through anything. Even if we make, say, the final a judge will have put us, say, 80th in the competition compared to other judges putting us second or first. Right. Um, which is a, just a crazy discrepancies comparatively. Whereas a lot, a, whereas most um, mainstream couples, um, when I talk about mainstream couples, I'm saying like a male-female couple wouldn't have as much um, discrepancy in their marks. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in that sense, there's a lot more bias going on, as in we get don't get as much active... Um, uh, homophobia against it, but we get a lot of bias. Right. Also, like, we, we talk about, like, not in our day, but actually, I think it was only something like 2015, they tried to ban same sex couples from the mainstream championships in the UK. Why? Um, what was their reasoning? Um, saying that, that they have an advantage. There was, it was just a, a few individuals who ultimately just didn't like same sex dancing, wanted to ban it. Um, there was a whole legal case against it. Again, some awesome people in the equality world fought against it and won, um, like in a legal battle against it, saying, actually, that's not right. Okay. Um, and in the UK now, um, we have to be allowed to dance in any mainstream competition wow. um, in the UK. That's not the case for Europe and that's not the case for globally. But in no. the UK, we have to be allowed to be able to dance. Do you think that the judges that are putting you, you know, 80th as opposed to the judges that are putting you first, do you think they're doing that as almost like a kickback to the fact that they didn't get their own way when they tried to ban the same sex Ooh, dancing? No, things? not necessarily, actually, because um, a lot of the people involved in that um, aren't the same judges, as in the judges, right. like, like, it's quite interesting. Um, ballroom is such a big field. So pole is quite small in the sense that... Oh, God, it's so small, kind of, right? Like as in, like as in, to the people listening, you'll be like, "Pole is not small; it feels huge." But actually, comparatively, like ballroom's been around for a much longer time than pole. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, I don't get judged by the same judges every week in the same way. There's there's some repeat, but like our coach, for example, she's judged in the five years she's been coaching us, she's judged us once. Like, right. and we compete. Like, we you know how much I compete. I compete like like 12, 15 times a year. Like, honestly, like, at least once, and then pole once on twice top, a month. you crazy person. So, yeah, in that sense, um, you don't get as much repeat. So it's not necessarily the same people judging. So it's, it's bias, I think. It's just that sense of being much more comfortable with seeing a man and woman being used to it as well. We have certain judges who, when they first mark us, mark us really quite poorly. And then over time, they start to look at the quality of the actual dancing. They don't get caught up in the, the fact there's no skirt swishing um, in the same sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, also different, um, there's much more international judging. So we compete on an international level. So we danced at the international championships. We've danced at the Opens, uh, the UK Open. Um, so you get international panels. Like a lot of our, um, a lot of our kind of pushback comes from, um, non-UK judges so uh, kind of European judges right. um, yeah mainly the Eastern had, European uh, pardon mainly the Eastern European ones yeah so like there was um, there was a reel I posted uh, so we won the Pink Jukebox Trophy which is the competition I mentioned 
um, earlier, which has been running, say, I don't know the exact amount of years that you'd be really annoyed if I listened to this. Um, so like 30 years or so. <laughs> it's been running a long time. Awesome people running an event for queer people every single year. Um, but so we won it, we won it, we won it the last two years. Um, and so, um, I posted a little reel of some of the footage of it. Um, that went viral in kind of Eastern Europe. Um, and then like, I was literally waking up to endless vomit emojis. So like, I woke up to my Instagram. I had to, I still have my settings completely changed on Instagram now where, cause I was waking up and each morning it would be like vomit, vomit, vomit. Um, there's also now the feature on Instagram to translate what someone's written in a comment. Right. So of like course. up until recently, I, I, I was just like, Oh, there's a Russian comment on my thing. Just leave it be. Oh, but see now there's the, that little translate button. I'm like clicking that button. I'm like, Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, it's like, like, it. This is quite vicious. Um, so like, like some real vicious kind of comments on there. Um, yeah. Uh, so, and, oh. and that's the culture a lot of some of the judges will come from. Some awesome dancers, um, but they've been brought up in a culture that has a lot of those opinions. Again, I'm not going to say all people from Eastern Europe uh, have those opinions. There's some awesome dancers from Eastern Europe. Um, some of our best friends are uh, dancers in Eastern Europe and um, having to fight a really hard battle, like as in um, dancers in Russia who we know uh, having to kind of barricade their doors and then make sure there are women and men dancing a ballroom practice to, to then, if they need to, switch partners and say, oh, we were practicing together rather than have the men dance with the men and the women dance with the women. There's like, they're doing awesome work in positions where actually they're much less safe than me and Vashesh dancing in London. So right. I don't want to kind of tar all um, of that, but a lot of our hate, a lot of our pushback does come internationally. Um, yeah. And how, how does that make you and Vijesh feel? Like, how do you guys deal with that? Um, it depends. It depends what mood I'm in. <laughs> So, so if, if I'm, if, if I'm in a good place and I, I'm loving my dancing, I, I'm really defiant. Like I will walk out and be like, this is my dancing. I'm dancing with my husband now. Like, as in like my favorite person in the world, I wouldn't want to dance with anybody else. So when people talk about like, um, the, one of the comments we get a lot is there are so many women who need a dance partner and you're taking up two men. I was like, I wouldn't want to dance with anyone but Vashesh now, competitively or performance wise. What an odd thing to say. Like, you're taking up to, there's plenty of men in this world. Why don't you go and get some of them start dancing? I think yeah. it's more a case of they're like, oh, we need more men who are good at dancing, is probably more the issue. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, yeah, seriously. Um, but again, as if it's if it's my fault that they can't get a dance partner. I was like, oh. well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be dancing with you. And then sometimes I go on their Instagram and I look and I'm like, there's no way in hell I'm dancing with you. Like, right. so you look at the, it's never the, it's funny enough. It's never the top dancers who are giving us heat. Mm. As in the the best people in the world actually, they're not they're not they're not giving us the crap. It, it'll be someone who's done one term of ballroom and then suddenly writing that I'm like the antichrist. Um, right. literally writing I'm the Antichrist um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but like, do you know what yeah. I feel like as she's talking about you know this whole episode we wanted to talk about crossover with Paul and we're definitely going to get onto that but um, that's actually a crossover as well I've noticed that actually the people who give uh, like Paul as shit are never the professionals it's never people of a good level it's always people who have maybe done a year of Paul and now all of a sudden they're an expert and it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll, 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 they'll have 300 followers and, yeah. and a kind of have, 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 yeah and kind of coming for you as if yeah right so you don't you don't let you take it too personally. You kind of because I've seen you are really good with the comments. I know you sometimes comment. You say thank you so much for engaging and building up the engagement on my post. It, and actually, <laughs> it's so true. It. Or I, I just or I, I just reply with a little pink heart. Yeah, like, as in like as in like just to make make certain people know that I I'm, I'm seeing your comment. Like, yeah, I am seeing your comment, but like you're not going to change my 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 view on on the like on the world. Um, I know I know I'm approaching dancing with kindness, as in I know I'm I, I know in my heart I'm doing the right thing. So I'm not going to suddenly go, oh, I actually this random woman in <laughs> in, in Russia has just said, oh, um, that she thinks that actually what I'm doing is perverted. Uh, <laughs> Shesh, I'm I'm going to dance with a woman now. Are you okay with that? It's just, um, it's just I think happen. we should get a divorce and I should go and find a woman to dance with. It's like, this mm -hmm. is the thing, like, I wonder if they ever think, like, what do they expect as an outcome from their yeah. comment, apart from obviously potentially making that person feel bad? Why does it make them feel good about themselves to do that? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. 
I just um, it's the, so the comment that hits me bad is when they criticize the dancing. When they when they're actually giving some critique, I'm like, oh, oh, that hurt me. <laughs> yeah. When they're like, oh, the footwork was wrong on that step. I'm like, was it? <laughs> See, right. That's what that's what that's that's the one that will hit me. As in telling me that I'm I'm doing something perverted is. Kind of, I'm like, well, it's not. I believe I, I completely disagree with you. When when they're, when when they're like, oh, they're not very good dancers. I'm like, okay, well, that's just an opinion. But like that hits me way harder than the homophobic ones. How <laughs> how do you take? Because um, I assume you must get this a lot, where people say, wow, like. I, this is so interesting to watch because I've never seen two men dance together before. Like, I, I don't know how to, to process it kind of thing. How do you take that? Do you find that insulting or do you find that okay? No, I think um, I'm fine with people being curious to new things. Like, as in, ask questions in life. Like, if you don't understand a style, if you don't, if you, if you're, like, ask questions. That's the only way you're going to learn what's what's going on. Mm-hmm. Like, as in, there's so many, there's so many dynamics to it as well in the sense that, I lead a lot more than the Shesh. So kind of I, I generally lead. Um, so we're actually really quite a traditional um, same-sex partnership. Um, if you look at our routines, there's a lot of figures in them that are from the syllabus book. Um, you'll be able to kind of recognise our cha-cha looks like cha-cha, our rumba looks like rumba, whereas a lot of competitors are actually going way more out there in terms of what they're doing. It's way less traditional, but will be seen as kind of this kind of other and kind of this this weird kind of, approach when actually what we're doing if you look at the footwork if you look at the steps it's really quite traditional um our approach to dance and we've got very traditional coaches right and yet and that's what you're going for you like the traditional it's just the only tradition you don't want to follow is the fact that you have to dance with a woman you want to dance with another man well yeah and like and, and there's elements that we like playing with um as in certain times kind of having a more feminine approach to leading I enjoy and um, like some femininity in leading is great. Um, but actually stepwise, I love the dance forms that I do. Like I, I love ballroom and Latin dancing. So like, I, I don't like, we're not trying to kind of destroy those in the way that people think we're, we're taking those and we're, we're dancing in a really quite traditional way. Like it's, it's all recognizable what we're doing. Um, so, you you talk about so ballroom and Latin is the is the blanket term, I correct? And yeah. you you know what you're just saying about you can recognise our cha cha and so is cha cha different ballroom and Latin? Okay, so um, ballroom and Latin in a competitive world is ten dances. So right. in the ballroom side, that would be waltz, foxtrot, Viennese waltz, quick step, and tango. Right. So if you were competing in a ballroom competition, you would do all five of those dances. Okay. If you were competing in the Latin section of the competition, you would dance cha-cha, samba, rumba, pasta doble, and jive. So those would be the five that you would dance in the Latin section. If you're dancing a 10 dance competition, you would dance all 10 dances. Um, And you can, and someone does these in front of you and you can tell instantly the difference between all the, it's it's very, very obvious. Yeah, because they're so distinctive. Um, You can if they're doing them traditionally. Sometimes. (laughs) Right. As in, especially there, there was this um, kind of trend on Insta in the boring world where you, people would post a video of something without the music and it's like, which dance is it? Um, which, which again, I, is not the way we are in the sense we, we're quite traditional. We quite like the dancers to look like the dancers. And again, it comes as well. It's a, it's a tricky one with, we talk about appropriation a lot, as in there's lots of stuff around um, appropriation of dance forms, kind of bastardization of dance forms. Like we have to have some respect for what, what you're doing as well. Um, and again, Borum and Latin has already taken dance styles and taken them in further directions than say, if you go to, like I've been to, I've, I've been to the countries where the dances are done. I've, I've been to, I've been to Brazil. I've done Samba in Brazil. It's very different to what I compete. Um, right. There's lots of elements that are really connected and feel really like they, they feel exactly like they were in that samba bar in Brazil. There's lots of elements as well. There's like no way would a Brazilian be doing that. Um, right. <laughs> so and like, you, as in... And you said about um, appropriation. This was really interesting to me. So um, tell me more about the appropriation part. So there's... Because only because, especially within the pole industry, we've had a lot of talk about appropriation of um, the stripper style and appropriation of twerking. And I was yeah. really interested when you said that, cause I didn't realize that you'd had any of that within the dance. Yeah, scene. of course. Wow, okay. Like it's, and, and these dance, so for example, Samba, there's lots of history of Samba being danced by slaves. Um, so kind of when we talk about Afro Samba and such, a lot of dancers right. of the origins, origins of Samba were kind of 
slaves dancing samba um, and then kind of you've got the Brazilian side of samba when we think of kind of like carnival we think of that side of samba again these are dances that are really important to people's culture right. so kind of the biggest thing I always say with things is um, it's having respect for a dance form mm-hmm. so having a respect for the origins that's the same and I would say that for Burma Latin and pole like as in um, and twerking any, any, any side of dancing know your origins of your dance forms as in and respect them now, within the pole industry, there was a discussion around twerking and how obviously it had come from sort of like Afro-Caribbean type roots and that the people teaching these forms should only be people of colour, people who come from the culture. What is the discussion in the pole, in the dance industry with things like that? Like with Samba, like you yeah. said, there was danced by slaves and stuff. I assume yeah. it was slaves that were probably people of colour. You know, is there any discussion around like really Samba should only be taught by people of colour? Is there any discussion on that or not so much? There isn't. Um, frankly, there's not enough people of colour dancing in the Borum Latin world. It's, um, it's, there's actually, um, there's some really great groups who are doing some really awesome work in Borum to try and improve that. Um, but, um, in the nicest possible way. Actually, one of the comparisons pole to ballroom, the ballroom world is far too elitist in the sense that it's expensive. Like if right. people think pole is expensive, try doing ballroom in Latin. As in, <laughs> like, as in comparatively, it's very expensive, like the access. So naturally, um, we have fewer people of color dancing ballroom and Latin. And actually, um, there's some great groups doing work. Um, Black in the ballroom um, do some really uh, are starting to do some really great work, um, but we need to be we we need to be respectful of the origins. Is right. the thing is is the way I see it. That's what most people like. When I went to when I went to Brazil um, and was kind of like going to samba bars or going to samba classes, I didn't go in going no samba's dance like this. Listen to kind of like the people who whose dance it is their culture. Kind of follow people like that. Kind of um, actually go to their workshops, go learn from them, become a better dancer as a result. Does that mean that you shouldn't be able to then teach? I don't think so. Like I teach from Borum and Latin. I, do I think um, do I think we should um, restrict it to only people who are of the culture? Not necessarily, as long as there's a level of re- pre- appreciation, a level of respect, and also that you're passing that on to your students. Because right. the amount of time people are like, well, yeah, I know my origins, but are you passing that on in your classes? Right. Are you talking about those things? Mm-hmm. Are you kind of putting it in your social media? Are you sharing kind of things of where the origins of dancing are coming from? Yeah. Like, um, I've got like a little WhatsApp group. I teach a queer, like, ballroom class on a Wednesday. Um, and like we've got a little WhatsApp and every so often I'll just share a video or something and be like, oh, look at this dance style. Do you see kind of how this has developed into what I was teaching you last Wednesday? Kind of that, that sort of thing. That's good. Um, or sharing sharing artists that are like in pole, for example, sharing like pole dancers who are like really authentic in their style and being like, this is what it is. This is what the style is. This yeah. is what we should be kind of digging up. I'm not trying to say that, um, no, my style is better than that. Actually, saying like giving giving platform as well. Yeah, yeah I had one of my friends, Shan, um, on Instagram, at Shannington Ratchet. She yeah. um, was talking to me about twerk, and she was saying about how she feels as well. Like, you know, there's no problem with her for white people talk, uh, teaching twerk, but she's like, it's about respecting where it's come from. It's about educating yourself and educating your students and making sure they understand the roots. Um, and she was mentioning about a teacher that she knew from the UK called Patricia the Tees, who is very respectful of the roots. Um, so, and I think that's just super important. I think the same has to be said with pole dancing. You know, it would be crazy really for me to teach pole the way that I do and to just totally ignore the fact that it came from stripping, you know, um, yeah. and its roots. And I think, you know, that that's really what's important. I think who teaches it is less of an issue, really. It's more about do they understand who created it, where it came from, and are they educating their students? I think that's the most important yeah. thing. You- yeah, and I've, I've had it as well, like, where I've also seen, like, there's – so um, I've had, I had, a, had quite a frank conversation with somebody I know um, where he was teaching – like he called it cha-cha. I was like, that, that's, that's got, that's, there's no cha-cha. Like you've literally watched a video of some cha-cha and gone, this is what I see from that. Um, and tried, and been like, yeah, I'm going to teach that. And I was like, it feels like parody. So like you, you then like anyone who knows the style and knows the, knows the real kind of roots of the style, knows the, knows the kind of substance of the style would feel offended by it. Right. Um, 
So it's, it's when you haven't done the work, like do the work on your styles. Um, yeah. If you're going to teach them, especially like if you're just, if you're just a student turning up to a class, yeah, you just turn up and you kind of take it in, I think. But as soon as you're in a position of responsibility, a position as a teacher, it is your job to know your styles, know the background, also know where your industry has failed in the past as well. So mm-hmm. in the ballroom world, we can do so much better um, at kind of respecting dance styles and trying to actually make them feel like the dance styles. There's some, there's some really interesting videos of like the eighties where like Samba in the eighties, like I, I'm, I'm not a big disco Samba fan. Like I like Samba that feels a little like it's got like a bounce to it. Like when you, when you see like, um, when you see kind of when you're dancing Samba in Brazil, like it's very low, it's very grounded, it's very earthy. And then you, you kind of watch, um, you watch like Anton Dubeck on Strictly and he's suddenly doing like night fever type um, <laughs> stuff. And I'm like, what the hell is that? Like, did so like, as in, I was like, as soon as you start doing things like that, I'm like that, that you know, I'm out, I'm out. That's not, that's not and what the dance does. does. Does he get any shit for that? Like, does he get any shit not, for no, well, doing things like that? A, a little bit, like as in, but not that much. Cause again, there's that whole sense of, oh, it's funny. Look, he's in flared pants and kind of in a cat suit in like in bright pink with kind of like, um, Anne Whittacombe kind of coming out of his legs or well, God knows what. Like people right. like loving it and laughing. Because, because again, like as in they, they're not seeing the origins. Um, mm-hmm. but actually like I'm quite, again, I'm a traditionalist. Like I love the origins of dance forms, knowing where they've come from. And I think it's really important to respect those. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah, like I don't know, I don't I, like if you show if I went to when I like when I was in Rio or like Sao Paulo and like if I'd have taken the video of like Anne Widdicombe Samba, like obviously she's a she was a weaker dancer, but if I like as in they'd be like, what is this? Like as in because it's it's just a parody. It feels like a parody as soon mm. as you start kind of laughing at the dance form. Whereas of actually course. these are dance forms that are hugely important to people. Same with pop, like as in kind of heels culture, kind of all of that is so important to people because they're so passionate about that. People who've danced it for years and years, originally in clubs and all of that side of it, side of it that, that people are so passionate. So when, so when you kind of like, when people kind of just put on heels and kind of parody it in a way to be like, um, it's kind of like, like we, I, we discussed before, like tricksters who kind of go, oh yeah, yeah, it's just heels. Well, yeah. No, like, as in, there's so much substance yeah. to that as a dance form. Like, like in the pole world, I'm more of a trickster. I like, I like tricks. I like splits. I like, I like all of that side of it. That's what I see. Like, that's what I love in pole. Um, but I would never, I would never just go and be like, like trying to just, just parody it in a way and just be like, yeah, I can do that. Like, the, me and Shash have this like running joke where it's like, a, you, you know, the Catherine Tate sketch where she's <laughs> yeah. like, I can do that. I could do that. Like, yeah, I, I, I love can do that. that. <laughs> I, I'm like people are people, there's far too much of that in the world. I think people who are just like, I can do that. I was like, there's, there's times I think I just need more confidence and just to be like a bit more, I can do that. But actually, actually, no, no, learn your craft. <laughs> it is <laughs> really funny more respect actually, for you. because Nicole the Pole, I had her on just recently, she organised all the tours for Snoop Dogg. And obviously Snoop Dogg was looking for women really that looked like and were dancing like they were in the strip club. Because that's a, a lot, he talks, he sings a lot about strippers. And um, some of the pole dancers that, were on stage were really not that style and maybe she just struggled to find as many like of that style in that country whatever it was just so funny like you said it's it looked like someone just said yeah okay I'll just shove some heels on I can do that and then they were just doing like loads of tricks and stuff and really Snoop just needed them to sort of hold the pole and shake their butt a little bit so he could like throw cash at them yeah (laughs) but it is funny isn't it but but for those people I think parodying like you said parodying is it's okay if you, you know, are understanding of the roots and you're understanding that actually you're not doing the traditional form and that you're just trying to do something that isn't exactly what you thought you were trying to do. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, as, long, as long as it's, um, yeah, I'm not so sure. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> like a, the it's whole a parody. T- like if it's intentionally a parody and it's very clear and it's when done you say in the place parody, of love. Are you saying like to get laughs? No, no, no. So, like, as in, well, in a way, yeah. So, like, if I talk about like Anton Dubeck on Strictly doing mm-hmm. Samba, like Anton Dubeck. By the way, I'm I'm coming for Anton Dubeck, but he's a beautiful ballroom dancer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lovely ballroom dancer. Um, but when obviously he has to do the Latin numbers as well. Um, and so some of the sambas were like, it just felt like as in, it feels like you're taking a dance that is very precious to people and just mm-hmm. just kind of laughing at it by by not taking it seriously, not learning it properly. Mm. Um. 
Yeah, and yeah. It's, the, it's the same. It's the same with pole. When like I would never cover a, a heels class, as in I would never cover even if even if it was like oh Darren, um, we're going to teach like intermediate and then um, we've got a heels class afterwards. I'd, oh, sorry, I, I can't teach that because I haven't invested enough time as mm-hmm. a heels dancer to do that with respect and do it well. Do it, like I could, of course, I could teach it. Like I'm of, of, as I, and get away with it, but it wouldn't be wouldn't feel right to me to do that. Yeah, I have to say, I put enough time. I, I made a mistake with that actually, because back when I first started doing heels, I started teaching it quite soon after. And now I feel like I'm definitely qualified to because I've done it for so long now. And I've learned from so many really, really good, authentic dancers, strippers, non strippers, all yeah. sorts, really. But yeah, I feel like that was totally an uneducated thing. I think nowadays, if I was going to like, let's say, for example, I went to learn twerking, for example, I now know so much more about like how important it is to learn in depth about the origins, about all the different styles and the techniques and not just kind of winging it. And I think when I first started it, I felt the pressure of, my students were like, oh, well, let's, let's dance some heels too. And I was like, oh, okay. So I just put these classes on where it's actually what I should have done. I said, no, actually, I can't really do that because I'm still learning myself. So let's wait. Let me learn yeah. some more and then we'll come back. Or, or just book somebody in and like, and it, right. that, that, even that conversation would have, would have come across so much better as a learning point for your students. Uh huh. For um, sure. Like, I'm I like, you, you know, my pet peeve in poll, which is like anyone teaching instantly. Like, I think. Yeah. <laughs> So like, oh, like, as in, I, I get so like, yeah, and just, the, just that said, like, you know, as in, like, you know what, I'm, though? I'm, the only I'm, thing I will say as defense to that is that normally it's not the person. Sometimes it's the studios because there are studios that sometimes are just desperate for teachers and they'll see someone with a small amount of talent and just be like, you, <laughs> you're next. Do you know what I mean? They'll be yeah. like, please, like, help me. Do you know what I mean? It's like. I feel that's unfair because a lot of people, do you know how many people over the years I've seen that have become teachers and all of a sudden they realise that actually um, they now can't compete because they have become a teacher too early. And it's like, it's sad for me because I'm like, I wish someone had told you about this because now yeah. they have to compete as a professional and they're like, I'm not a professional. I'm, I'm still learning yeah. myself. And I'm like, well, Technically, your class is like a semi-pro or whatever because yeah. you've done this. So it's, it just really sucks, really. Yeah. Hey, so sorry to interrupt your episode. I just wanted to come on real quickly and tell you about the sponsor for this week's podcast. And this week is sponsored by Pole Active. Pole Active are a US-based one-stop shop for everything you need for pole dancing. And I'm literally looking at the website now. And this shop, I've never seen the shop with so much choice in my life. It is crazy. They've got all sorts of things clothing-wise for pole dancing they've got accessories for pole dancing they've got shoes for pole dancing a range of brands on there some of these brands i've never even heard of before and i'm learning about them purely from this website so if you want to go and find out about lots of different pole brands go and check out pole active let's get back to the podcast yeah. um, one thing you mentioned earlier on actually that i just want to go back to because i'm really intrigued you know you said about oh people moan about how pole is expensive you should see how expensive this dance um, lesson ballroom. Talk to us about that. Tell me roughly. I mean, how much is it to enter a competition, for example? Oh, it depends on the competition. But um, so I was literally meant to be at a competition right now, which is why I'm free. Uh, yeah. So I had to pull out because of an injury. Um, but so like um, the one we were competing at, it would have been four hundred pounds for four days of competition. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, so £100 a day. I mean... Well, no, three days, actually. Yeah, so 130 per event, per day. And that would wow. have been a... But the thing is, though, it boring oh, wait, on a per lot couple. Per couple. Per couple, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's not per person. Okay, no. fine. Um, I mean, it's still quite expensive. Again, costume-wise, um, coaching. So private lessons, for example, um, are much more expensive in the boring world. Um, like, yeah. How much are we um, talking? Oh, I don't know. 500 So my lesson, which is over, which is an hour and a half, is over, and I'm just going to go over a number, but over 120. Oh, okay. Sorry, you're talking about the lessons now. So, what, yeah. so over 120 for an hour for a lesson. Okay. Yeah. Well, an hour and about, a half. What about costume? Oh, really depends. Um, so our purple costumes, they cost us a thousand pounds. Wait. 
For both, or for thousand yeah, each? Yeah, for both. So oh, 500 gosh. pounds for each of those costumes. Which which in the pole industry, 500 is like, that would be top end like yeah, costume. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy, isn't it? But also it's worth mentioning as well, you said 400 pounds for three day event. How many people are competing at this event? Oh, it depends. Depends on the depends on the event, but say in say at the UK Open in our category, just so just one category, three hundred couples. Wait, wait, three hundred couples. Sorry, three hundred pairs. Of, so six hundred. Three hundred pairs. Yeah, couples. Oh my god! So this is the thing, actually, and this is one thing that I think is really important to talk about because anyone who's listening to this who thinks pole competitions are expensive. They actually aren't expensive, but also what we don't consider is the fact that we don't have anywhere near as many competitors. Like, yeah. so we don't have anywhere near that many people competing, like, or yeah. entering these competitions. So we just don't make that same amount of money. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I, I can completely feel for pole organizers who are trying to. So the boring world, it's um, you also have the thing of boring world has a lot more children. So with children, you get two automatic spectators in their parents so <laughs> instantly you've got right. two parents who are watching um so they've paid a spectator fee um children's entry is normally quite cheap comparatively um but even so there there'll be a spectator fee for the parents um all of that so like a lot of boring competitions they 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 can do that um and with that that it is a lot f- not fair necessarily but it, it makes bias a lot less impactful on the basis that you have bigger panels at big events so, so at uh, that uh, one, uh, there was a panel of normally you have two panels who are not judging all day. So again, nicer for the judges. Um, you'd have twelve at least mm-hmm. judging each category. Right, a, a, a bigger comp, uh, say a big title. Okay, so it, make, it just makes it a little bit a little bit better for when obviously one person decides they just don't like the style or whatever and they yeah, give it a really low exactly. mark. So yeah. all of that. Whereas sometimes pole competitions you'd have three. Um where actually so each of those three has quite a big impact on that result. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah you have quite a bigger panels. Um they're bigger events. Um you don't know the music actually in Ballroom and Latin. Oh yeah I remember you saying to me I yeah. love that. So and how does that work? I need to ask because it's I, mean, I think I asked you this before, and I want to go over it again just so people can hear it, because I think I asked you this question before in one of your privates when you told me about that. And I remember saying, like, but how do you know what the beat's going to be? And you said generally within, like, the first sort of few seconds, you already can hear the beat and you know it. But you know yeah. how some songs have, like, it just goes slow all of a sudden? Like, it will just yeah. have, like, a slow, and then it will go back fast again. Yeah. How do like, you know I, I, when They that's should coming? generally do that. Like, so someone running the music for a boring competition, they shouldn't do that. But you have change in energy within the music, and as right. a dancer, you're meant to pick up on that and dance to the music that's actually playing. So, like, those impact bits, those sections of piece music where there's a hit, you want to still be trying to kind of change your energy. Uh-huh. Um, it's, and so a lot of our coaching is on musicality. Um it's one of the things that actually I do love about the dance world compared to pole. We focus a little bit more on the how. Um, in the pole world, it's like, I've done that trick, tick. Not the how did you do that trick? What mm-hmm. was the journey into that position? What was the shape on that position? Kind of uh-huh. how could you play with the angles? Where's the chest? Is the chest to here? Is it an inward position to there? Um, whereas in Boring Latin, we're so into all of that. Like, as in every single element of the dancing. Um, we've never really gone that far, that way with uh, as a pole industry. I think it's... Um, I'm more in the tricks world. I think the heels world do it a little bit better. Um, but yeah, in for sure. Tricks world, oh, I was going to say, yeah. I definitely think the heels people... I mean, people like... I mean, I'm just going to name one. Like, Carmine Black, I know, is very yeah. into that. Very into intentional movement and stuff. And, yeah, it's definitely becoming more popular. Definitely, I agree with you. It's more within the heels side. Um, Tricks-wise, I would tend to agree with you. But do you think that's more because it's still... The, the pole is still within its infancy still, you know? So maybe it's just... Um, it's going to take time. Um, I don't think so, in the sense... I think it's more the social media sense of poll, um, it becomes very get a trick sort of thing, post it, then move on to something else. We, um, okay. whereas actually, like, honestly, I, if you saw some of my training sessions for Borum and Latin, I work on just stepping forward with my left foot, how I would step forward with my left foot. 
I know how to step forward with my left foot, but I'm like playing with it. As in what, in what action is it? Where is the movement? Is it from the hip initially? Where is that rotation of the knee? Am I holding that for slightly a little bit more? Am I going to then rotate backwards? How am I going to rotate backwards? What am I going to use to do that? Is it going to be more muscular? Is it even more flowy? Playing with those, trying to do it to different pieces of music and really create that. Whereas in pole, it'll be like this week we're working on this trick and then you have an amazing session, you get the trick, and then next week we we don't go, okay, we've all got this trick, we're now going to play with that trick. Um, mm-hmm. We go, okay, we've all got that trick, um, we all posted it on social media, and then next week we're doing a new trick. Um, so we end up that sort of approach. Um, whereas I think the best dancers in the pole industry, uh, the people who are, you, you know, that when you watch a piece, like, I've watched yours, I've watched other like dancers and just been amazed by certain sections. It's because you've looked at those tricks you're putting in and gone, how does that fit to the music? How do I make that exactly right? Like, um, yeah, mm-hmm. even just talking to some of the best in pole, they really understand it, as in they understand their movement. Well, we've got this thing within pole, um, and again, I've definitely talked about this on this um, podcast before. Um, we have this thing within pole where we want this quick photo we want this like i want it now i want to i want to learn this jade split today and i want to photo with it for instagram today yeah. as well yeah. do you get any of that within ballroom latin not so much not so much no and like why do you think that is will, people will work on choreographies for years so some of the top dancers um so some of my favorite dancers they had the same material in their competition routines for 10 years some of that material was the same choreography, but done in so- you look at it side by side from say 2012 to, two, to 2022, and it's insanely different because they've developed it. They've worked on every element of that movement and created something so special out of it. Um, right. Obviously, sometimes you want to develop by just going with new choreography, something faster, something with something with, which is more dynamic. So just a step that you've outgrown, but actually that, ability to kind of take a step and just play with it do something more interesting with it what's the entry um that's gonna be my excuse for putting a saturday split in every single one of my routines ever because i'm working on new ways of putting energy into my saturday split but but it is true but and also you do also when you do your saturday split i mean we joke but you do always try and look for different ways in and out to try and keep it fresh and and, and not even in and out but just in what's the shape of the chest is it where is the shoulder what is the kind of grip what would be relaxing are we going to relax that hand and then change the shape with a little bit more of a back bend we don't talk about that and we don't talk no. about in class even in advanced classes we don't talk about that that much um, and maybe we will um, maybe maybe we'll start playing right. with it and I, I think people will start to enjoy their dancing a little bit more because sometimes we get frustrated rather than um, enjoying the process of things that we know because we're constantly in a phase of with pole now this is also the thing I love about pole so um, <laughs> it's kind of tricky because I love that sense of you like I, it was on Tuesday actually like we had a group class where there were like three of us and it was a trick that none of us could do at the beginning of the class and then by the end of the class we could all do it it was an amazing feeling like all three right. of us but um, sometimes actually I think we need to take a step back and then go back to it and go how can we do it differently this was like the this was the the base way of doing it but actually like okay we're going to do it in more different ways like different even changing that leg changing the changing which action you do first in the entry to the movement um i don't i don't don't think we do that enough in the whole world i think we could it will just and it'll make people better dance and they'll enjoy the process more because it's things that you already know how to do so we, we, we don't we get so caught up on trying to do a more advanced trick, like layering constantly more advanced. It needs to be more advanced. Whereas actually going in and going, okay, today group, we're going to work on leg hangs. And, and sometimes you'll, 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 you'll gather a group, well, oh, I can do an inside leg hang. It's like, yes, but how are you doing your inside leg hang? What is the yeah. angle of that inside leg hang? Kind of what's the angle of your knee? If you change that, if you change that foot position, if you flex that foot at this point, what's the look? What do you like? What don't you like? If I play these different musics, how would you do that inside leg hang differently? And I don't think yeah. a lot of teachers would know how to do that. Um, mm. Yes, to learn students. Um, yeah, it is true because it's that whole thing of like, I like to teach people that there's you know more than one way to skin a cat kind of thing like a j split for example can be you can make a j split look different in so many different ways but like you said that's still not the same as what you're trying to explain to to say oh we can do a different 
a you know, different style. It's just a variation of the trick. It's not actually thinking about the muscle engagement. You know, like you said, if you turn your knee slightly out or if you turn it slightly in, like what's the difference in the look? What about if you sickle your foot a little bit? What about if you flex a little bit? All these things about how you can make the shapes are just slightly different and these very small intentional movements. Yeah. Think, we don't, you're right, we don't think And I think it's something it. that actually a lot of dancers, it would improve their dancing. It would really Agreed. improve their dancing. I think they'd understand their dancing more. To become dancers as opposed to, um, uh, yeah, tricksters. But again, yeah. that's, uh, yeah. But it's also, it's, it's tricky because it's also the thing I love about pole, the fact that I'm, there's that sense of getting something. And whereas like ballroom feels like a long game. It feels like a long game. <laughs> and I, I don't of notice course. the improvement in the same way because I spend so much time working on detail and things. I don't, there's not suddenly, oh, I can do that. I couldn't do that at the beginning of today. Now I can do that. It's a sense of eking out that quality, um, which is a, which over 10 years, I, if I looked at the videos, I'm like, oh my God, the difference in me as a dancer is insane. But the, right. it, it, it takes, the, it takes, it takes work. Um, it's I not think that's down. because you're doing a dance style that's developed over hundreds of years. So it's that whole thing of like, you guys have had the time. Do you know what I mean? You've had the time to really delve deep. We're still so in the infancy of pole because there's still so many things we're discovering. And yeah. I mean, every every month I see like, oh, a new shape or a new transition that we just didn't even think of. Or, yeah. you know, like I remember when, I always distinctively remember when um, Marlo created Bird of Paradise. Yeah. And how everyone was like, wow, like, oh my God, this is amazing. So we've never seen before. And then Yvonne Smink was creating these transitions that people hadn't seen before. So we're still... We're still just at the point that we're we're realizing that we can do the salsa, but we're not looking at how we can do the salsa. We're looking just so deeply into it and how yeah. we can change that style. But yeah. um, one one thing actually that we, um, funnily enough, is one of the main things I want to talk about. But I've only just now remembered that I wanted to mention it because I think it's so important again for pole dancers to hear this. Because I was shocked when you told me this, but you tell me how. I remember saying to you about feedback and how some people were complaining they weren't getting feedback competitions. And you were like, feedback? What is feedback? We don't get feedback. <laughs> Tell me about that. So, I yeah, and that in the ballroom and crazy. Crazy. in the competition, um, you would get the results. Um, you would go online and you all get, or we all log on to see the results. They're placings. Literally, where the place judge placed you. So if the judge put me first, I would see that that judge put me first in that dance. Um, and then I would see, oh, that judge in the final put me sick. And say in previous rounds, um, I would see, okay, that judge put me through to the quarter final, but not through to the semi final. I would see all of that because they, they right. it's just, just done on, on, on those things. But yeah, we don't get a single piece of feedback, um, in terms of written feedback from judges at all. Um, and this will be controversial. I prefer it that way. Um, <laughs> as in, as in, I, I, I don't need necessary. I've got eyes. My coach has eyes as in go back to your coach take the video um, and then you can look at the look at the material but actually when a judge is judging a lot of the time it's comparative so they may write so you may you may have done something insanely um, advanced um, and you've done something amazing and then they have to write I would prefer more advanced figures because you were competing against the most ridiculous pole dancer um, who, who, who was there but it's it's it's, you, it's really hard for a judge to write something that is actually really going to change the way that you're going to dance. Whereas you need to work with a coach who, who knows your journey um, and knows kind of where you're going. The judge is comparing you to four other people against a set mark scheme. That's the, that's all they're doing in that moment. And people get so caught up on those words as if they're right. like the gospel and they're literally the description of how they are as a person, how, as in it defines the, their whole training process, just because of words. I was like, that is what that person found those three minutes to be. That's all it is. Right. Um, as in, I, I take much more credit in what my coaches say. Take the video right. back, show the video to your coach. They'll go, okay, that was that, that was that. Um, who, and then look at who won. Look at who won. You can see the differences in those things. Um, I think I have a question. Yeah, I think people actually, put a lot of weight into feedback. Focus on what your journey is in dance, in pole, um, and then and then continue along that journey. Um, if you're not continuing, if you're then still not getting the results you want, you would reach out to the judges. So, for example, I do workshops. Right. I would go to workshops with people who judge me as well. So I've got my main coach and then we would go to say a workshop with 
um, some of those judges, for example, who are going to be judging us at some comps. I wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily be my main coach, but I will attend a 40-person workshop. They'll probably give me some kind of thing of what they feel about my dancing. You can then get that way. Um, whereas actually a lot of the time I feel like judges, um, you've literally got how long, to, like you, you've judged loads. So like you have a minute to write something. So you've watched the routine minute maybe, yeah. if you're lucky mm. to write something that yeah. they, that this competitor wants to see as insightful as their way to move forward. You have right. a lot of capacity to do it. Like <laughs> yeah. that's real. you've actually, if you want the opinion, say if, if I feel that say, Say, if I saw that Annie Norris, say, if she were judging me, had put me in fifth place out of those five judges, and I felt that wasn't fair, book a private with her. Pay her the money to then go for it properly on what she wants from me as, as a dancer. So right. that's, that's my stance. Yeah. I have a question with regards to, um, you know, when, when, when we're asking for feedback and stuff, we're always wanting to know what people think because obviously we need that feedback on what we want to do better. But sometimes people get really upset when these judges who are judging us can't do what we're doing. Now, in your industry, when people are judging you, are these people who have danced for years or is it literally just someone that's been trained to sit there and watch you? Are these professionals so, top yeah, of the this, game? So this is another thing that's actually, this, but this is again an infancy of pole issue. Um, in the born world, you can't judge a pro category until you've retired. Right. So you can't so, be competing pro and judging right. pro. So you are not being judged by your peers. You're being judged by people who've been there, done that. In the biggest competitions, you need to have achieved the things. So, for example, um, so the UK clothes, for example, you need to, like, so, uh, not that's not that's like example, say the, the top festivals, you would need to have actually had results in those festivals to be judging them. Um, wow. in, the, in, in those okay. biggest comps. In those biggest comps. So it's people who've been there and done it. Um, and it's and it's a prestige thing, like as in when you're asked to judge those events, it is seen as a as a as a, as a it's a seen as a mark of respect. That as in that you that you've achieved those things, and then you go on to judge those things. Um, it's a big right. thing. Um, whereas in the pole industry, we're still in that infancy phase of uh, if if you weren't if only people who'd retired were allowed to judge, you wouldn't have judges uh, judging pro categories. Um, of course, yeah. You just wouldn't have any judges. Um, there just wouldn't be enough of them. I and mean, there are. Like, I look at people like, you know, Donna Gant, Deb, um, Deb Riley, people like that who are still in the industry but don't compete. And they're like, they're very much retired when it comes to competing for sure. Um, I think they could. I think so. There comes uh, then a problem of people think that it then becomes a bit biased um, because it's always the same people and sometimes those. You know, some of the competitions are trying to make it so that it's, you know, more random people to try and make it a little less biased. I mean, what's what's your thoughts on dance competitions becoming biased because it's always um, judges and stuff? So first of all, make sure you've got a big enough panel. Make sure that you're inviting people from different areas. So in big competitions, it would be internationally. So it's um, saying that, so I dance obviously equality and mainstream. In the equality European championships, it needs to be from a certain different number of countries. For European wow. championships, um, okay. for the panel. So you, you can't have, say, a whole panel of UK judges judging me against a German couple and then suddenly, oh, the UK couple won, load of bias, um, right. things like that. But also, mm -hmm. it, um, it's also a tricky thing in the sense that there are no, there's no real boards as much. Obviously, in the pole sports arena, there is. Um, but yeah. in other areas of pole, there aren't. So there aren't those rules of what a competition can and can't do. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's so for it to be uh, a European Championships, it has to be allocated by the European Same Sex Dance Association for the same sex dance. Right. So they have to allocate it. They will only allocate it if it hits these certain criteria. Um, right. So like there are at least seven judges. The judges are from this number of countries. Um, all of those things. Um, like mm. as in, those are just two examples. Whereas yeah. in the pole industry, we don't have those set competitions. Also an issue of why so many pole competitions, I think are struggling because there are no set big competitions now, like as in yeah. which, which would be, so in, in the boring world, I know my big events for the year. I can look at the calendar and go, these are my big events. The mainstream world, we do obviously mainstream and equality comps. So I know we're doing the European equality comp 
the European same-sex championships, which is important to us. I know we're going to do the UK same-sex championships. Again, important to us. Um, we do the Pink Jukebox because it's a historic event and we will always want to support these people who've run this awesome event for so long. We will always do that. Then we do our mainstream comps. We will do the UK Open. We'll do the internationals. We'll do the UK Closed. Those are big comps. Mm -hmm. Then, so they're the ones that are doing really well because they're the big comps anyway. Then beyond yeah. that, you have um, Sunday League. So you have league competitions where you can earn points towards the league system. So people can win okay. kind of a league as well by doing the smaller events. Whereas in pole, it's just this kind of endless different competitions. You see something come up on Instagram. Oh, that looked like a fun comp. I might do that next year because they enjoyed it. Um, whereas, and then you've got other comps that are really struggling because they haven't man managed to attract people. But what is the, what is the big, what's the big comp? Who would we say, uh, I can't say, oh, that person is that because they won that. Right. In the same way. I can't be like, these yeah. are the big names who should be allowed to judge because they've won X, Y, and Z in the same way. Well, this There's is a the few... problem that we have is because now we we just have so many different comps and we don't know what the big ones are because there aren't any. Um, and it's just, you know, there's lots of comps that are all on the same playing field. And I think you're right in the sense that it all comes down to that we're not regulated and we don't have like a, a governing body um, like most of the dance. But do you know what it is, right? It's because in our industry, we have a lot of people within the industry that just wouldn't accept it. And I wonder actually years and years ago, back before our time probably, when, when governing bodies were introduced in the dance industry, whether there was much kickback on them as well. Because, um, I mean, it wasn't necessarily for competitions, but there was, I remember uh, Sarah Brown and Stacey Snedder tried setting up um, Pulse Safe Federation, which is all about pole safety. And again, there was much kickback on that because people were like resenting paying for it and yeah. they were giving resources and stuff. So it was like, why are people kicking back on this? Because yeah. you know, they're trying say, to help. There'll always be kickback. Um, for example, I'm constantly kicking back at the organisation because obviously, um, like I was saying, the organisations that tried, there was, there was organisations that tried to ban us, for goodness sake. So I was right. like, of course I'm kicking back at them. Um, but I think overall having organisations is a good thing. Um, because they can kind of actually guide the route. It's really important making sure it's ground roots, that actually people involved in it are the people who are dancing, they're the people competing in pole, they're the people kind of doing pole. And the people who originated pole as well have those people mm. like actually involved. Then you start to actually yeah. make change in a way that's um, positive. I think there'll always be kickback, um, and I'm for kickback. Kick back all, all all you want. Like I'll I'll I'll, I'll have to, if someone if someone's putting in a rule that I think is really discriminatory against equality dancers, I will be pushing back against that. I will be like calling it out. Um, in the same yeah. way, I'd expect the UK Same Sex Board to be calling it out. There was this yeah. um, a couple of years, well, a year or two ago. No, it's only a year ago. This guy in um, Blackpool, he did this lecture. He's a very famous dancer. Um, as in, anyone who knows me will know exactly who I'm complaining about because I've um, played about him a lot. Um, I'll say his name, Sammy Stockford. Um, so he did this lecture in Blackpool, essentially saying, when I, in my day, when I was a kid, um, sex was between a man and a woman. Nowadays, it's between um, a man and the alphabet. You know, the LGBTQs, X, Y, D, 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 D. Um, and then he went on into this whole misogynistic um, rant about kind of women he's danced with. Um, so he was actually um, Shirley Ballas' husband, uh, strictly judge Shirley Ballas' husband. He was like, if, um, if um, yeah, he, he said so many misogynistic things in this lecture. Um, so, of course, oh, you have, and he's, he's at the top of one of the boards. So you have to push back against things, like as in, mm -hmm. because otherwise people get away with like doing these things and, and such. But does that mean I disagree with um, having those boards? No. I think it, it helps. It helps create a framework. And I think it will help um, some of those smaller comps that are really struggling. And um, even bigger comps are struggling because there isn't that sense of um, that comp being the be all and end all anymore. Like, as in, um, I'm not going to say the comp. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, 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 no. I was, I was like, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to go into that debate again. I think you, you probably have enough podcasts and I've done enough, done enough on debate on that. More, yes, than, exactly. more than enough on that stuff. <laughs> um, so we're not going down that route. But as in, but if there were, if there were frameworks and things, then I think, I think comps would actually thrive a bit more. Yeah. 
Um, right. And I, I, like you said, I like, like you said, there's sort of like a, a, a path up to these big competitions. It, like in pole, some people, their first competition is a, a big, isn't it? Like, pole, like pole theatre UK, which is one of the biggest pole theatres, for example. Yeah. You know, what sort of, you know, and they're having to compete at a professional level when they've never competed before. And it, yeah, there's, there's work to be done, for sure. And I think the difficulty is, is that because of the kickback, people are too scared. I mean, don't get me wrong, maybe when I get to a point when I retired kind of doing you know, my workshops and things like that, where, where it doesn't really matter so much what people think of me, because actually my, my career relies on what people think of me. When it gets to a point where I don't really care about that, maybe I'd be a good person to say, well, do you know what? I'm very much out of the industry now in the sense I don't teach workshops, I'm not competing. I'm very much retired, but I'm still in pole. I've still got my studio and stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my now free time that I would have done for doing workshops to create this federation i'm going to get all these people involved and we're going to have to you know charge like a federation fee to make to pay all these people and make sure it works and yeah. you know that, that's, actually, time, that's exactly oh it in God. the sense that in the boring world the people who are in those are generally um the majority of them are people who have retired from competing now they're mm-hmm. there they yeah they kind of they they want to kind of keep in the industry keep moving it forward and they run um so for example the bdf and um, the british dancers federation like as in they they run kind of they'll run a at the festival they'll run a series of lectures that um funds a lot of their activities things like that um uh-huh. and then they're there to represent dancers um in in those processes um then you've got different organizations again in the, i'm not you're gonna ever say the born world's organizations are the example to use um anyone who's listening to this from a ballroom perspective will be like darren's like praising these organizations um there's like so much politics in the ballroom world as in you've got conflicting world organizations wtc wds there like let's not i'm not i'm not presenting it as um that the organizations we have are great um there's a lot of infighting there's a lot of politics there's a lot of dancers pulled in different directions we're quite safe because i'm being an equality dancer um nobody really cares about us that much so we have our own little world we have our own little um little world as well um we it's important to me and Pashesh that we're able to go out into that mainstream world as well and represent ourselves and compete fairly um against kind of mainstream couples but we do have our safe spaces as well i always compare it to kind of in the lgbt world you'd have like a gay bar like that's your safe space hopefully like or queer bar lgbt space that's meant to be like a safe space for you um, which is like the same sex world. And then you'd have that mainstream world that's kind of, you want it to be a safe space for you, but actually your kind of, your kind of comfort is kind of still going to that RBT or the, or two brewers, like South London game. Right. It's coming up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, Darren, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I, I could talk about this for ages because the crossover is just insane, really. Um, but, where, where can people come and find some of your videos? I know you don't post loads of your dance because you do use them again for competitions. Yeah, like, as in, like, like, like I'm saying, so as in that, that ten year thing. As in, like, there's some bits of our jive. Honestly, our jive. There's the beginning of it. We've had it for five years. Like, if anyone sees it, they're like, oh, they're doing that same material again. But we are constantly changing. It. We're constantly changing the way we do it. Um, that's that's what that's my argument. Anyway, um, you can catch me on Darren Dance Fitness on Instagram. Um, that's where I post most of my stuff. Um, I also run my um, queer ballroom class in London. So if anyone ever wants um, a safe space to do ballroom and Latin um, leading or following, um, you can do that. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your kind of your background. Um, you can lead if you're a, a woman, um, or if you're if you want to switch between the roles again completely cool with that so yeah reach out to me about that as well if anyone wants some support i love that and yeah if you're in london definitely go and check out darren's class because it sounds like so much fun if i lived in london darren i'd be there all the time you know that (laughs) i live way too far away but um, thank you so much for coming on thank you for all your insight it's been lovely talking to you and until next time thank you Bye. bye Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. And remember, if you've got someone that you want to see on this podcast, you need to drop me a message and let me know who you want on, and I will make sure it happens. So, until next time. That was all the tea that you can get this week. Join me next.